I think we need to go ahead and um, get started with our next session. So glad that all of us are able to connect. I am going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Shushitra. Suchitra Chandrasekharan, also known as Suchi, is an associate professor of the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine. Currently serving as the director of research in maternal fetal medicine and the co-director of resident research at Emory University, she actively shapes the future of obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Chandrasekharan has extensive training, including residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Ohio State University and a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Additionally, she completed a master's in science in clinical epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, further enhancing her expertise in research methodologies. She has been a part of numerous communities and publications related to obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Chandra Sukaran is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and maternal fetal medicine, demonstrating her dedication to maintaining the highest standards of clinical practice. She is the fellow of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and actively contributes to advancing the field through her research and clinical work. Please welcome Dr. Chandra Sakarn as she presents a pilot study on implementing postpartum cardiometabolic clinic service line. Dr. Chandra Sakarn. Um, thank you all. I'm Suchi. I am an MFM at Emory. And um, I want to thank GAPQC for giving us the opportunity to share our program here today. But more importantly, I want you all to leave here maybe with having more questions about what is postpartum than when we came in with. So what we've done, it's just a small piece of the puzzle. It's just a drop in the bucket. We need to unite and do this bigger and more. So I am excited to share it, but I also hope that we kind of rethink about postpartum. So that's kind of my goal with this talk. No financial disclosures, but my personal disclosure is I am a mom of two. I have had a baby in the NICU, and I have had absolute firsthand experience in forgetting mom's help postpartum as a busy fellow at Penn and doing my master's. So um, can connect with a lot of these things. So we're going to start with the why. Why did we kind of think about this clinic in the beginning? We're going to talk about, I say, the weeds. How did we set up the operations? What happened? The data, what have we found? And I am going to present some preliminary data that we have also presented at our Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine meeting. And then we're going to talk about the future. Where are we going? And that's the key to where this group is huge and vital because that future involves all of us and it can't just be certain peoples. So the why. I'm going to start with what is postpartum. And I decided to go to the most trusted source because, I mean, where else do we go? Google, right? Because what is postpartum? Well, Google says postpartum begins soon after the delivery of your baby and lasts six to eight weeks. But here's what I love. It says, and ends when the mother's body has nearly returned to its pre-pregnant state. Please raise your hand if within eight weeks your body was in the pre-pregnant state. And if it was, I don't think I like you anymore, but I'm kidding. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Okay. That's Google, fabulous. <laughs> Miriam Webster, come on, come on, Miriam Webster, this is legit. Occurring in the beginning of the period following childbirth, well, that's the rest of my life. <laughs> so am I postpartum the rest of my life? National Cancer Institute, guys, come on, this is legit now, right? Like we're getting into real data here. The time that begins right after a woman gives birth and lasts about six weeks. Okay, so that's where our magic six weeks is at. Because, you know, we all felt totally normal at six weeks. <laughs> ACOG. Real legit. We have to trust it. The 12 weeks following the birth of a child. So ACOG gave us a little bit of an extension here. But, you know, again, I hope this shows you and makes you all think, what is postpartum? Is it an emotional thing? Is it a physical thing? Is it a time-based thing? And by the way, I did find out how the six-week thing happened. Can I move? Can you all hear me? Because I hate standing by the mic, so I'm going to move here. The six-week thing actually came 
with older men, no offense to the men in the audience, but older men in the field where it was thought at six weeks people should have a follow-up visit. And that's where postpartum came. Now think about it. Prenatal care, for the most part, is pretty regular, right? It doesn't matter if you're at Wellstar, Piedmont, MCG, wherever in the country. We do prenatal care a certain way. Why don't we do postpartum care a certain way? Where did that paradigm change? And why do we think postpartum is at six weeks and magic happens? So this is the deal. Now, I love this, right? So ACOG is great, because ACOG has finally agreed. Somebody said the phrase postpartum and beyond, and I loved it, because that was actually the name of the course I did at SMFM, was the fourth trimester, postpartum and beyond. And everyone said they felt like they were seeing Buzz Lightyear every time they saw the name of that course. And so um, I love that, because the postpartum and beyond is really important. We got that message. And this is what ACOG says we should do. Oh, look at the care team. Look at postpartum visits, infant feeding plan, which Dr. Callens here told us how that is, right? A little bit defined and detailed and takes time. Okay, reproductive life and contraception, pregnancy complications. Oh, let's also talk about arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. What am I? Face me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Pocket. Sure, you can hold it. Okay, there we go. Better? Okay. So we're supposed to talk about mental health, postpartum problems, chronic health conditions, and all of this in a 20-minute return visit. No problem, people. No big deal. Let's do it. So are we really shocked there's a problem with postpartum? Like, I mean, we set it up ourselves. But then, what is postpartum really? Probably some of that. Probably a bit of that. Some of that, some of that. You're supposed to feel like you're doing all of that, but that's actually what you feel like. So that's probably the reality of postpartum. And my interest in this area didn't just start now. When I was a fellow at Penn, my interest started in cardiometabolic health, hypertension, diabetes, obesity. So this article is 2015, guys, 2015. So not quite 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. And I, at that time, we did a survey, basic survey, nothing crazy, but just to look at risk perceptions of, you know, future cardiovascular health postpartum. Because the last talk we heard, most women don't know that they're at risk, right? And really, where did that data come? Because you're right, when I started residency in 2007, it was the delivery cure for pre, pre uh, delivery is the cure for preeclampsia. So it was really in 2010, 2011, when they started getting data from um, hospitals, especially in Scandinavia, the Netherlands, where you have long-term data, that the original data started to show that pregnancy is the window to future health. That's where they were able to see women in their 50s and 60s and go back and look at their data because they had great data collection. So this is newer if you think about it in terms of medicine and in terms of obstetrics. It's a newer concept that disease in pregnancy and pregnancy itself is really that window to future health. So this was one of the first studies. We thought, hey, let's just see what do moms understand. And what we found out, interestingly, is that when you even look at something like the risk of myocardial infarction, an MI, or a heart attack, only about 14% of moms with what we would call severe preeclampsia thought they were at risk, 8% of moms without severe features, and then when it came to high risk, only 3 to 4% of them even thought they were at risk. And I would think that, you know, over time, life should change, because this was almost 10 years ago. Well, this paper just got published here very recently, and Dr. Stanhope, who's sitting in the audience, sent me this paper. It's a qualitative analysis, so it's a little bit of a different study where they do interviews. And what they found here are these phrases. I thought the immediate danger was over because you're kind of always told, oh, the cure for preeclampsia is delivery. This is 10 years later, people. This is what people still think. I think I was supposed to have gotten a list of healthcare providers, mental healthcare providers in my area, but I don't know that I actually got it. I know I was supposed to, but I may have to follow up on it, right? 10 years later. I'm getting used to so much stuff in the postpartum period, they were not able to provide initial information about the preeclampsia. So nothing's really changed. We got the data, we have a theme, we keep saying the same theme over and over again, but nothing's really changing. I'm going to take it a little personal for a minute to show kind of where our history started, and this is important. 
So I was originally at the University of Washington after I ended fellowship, and in 2020, in the heat of COVID, I moved to Georgia. And it was an interesting time for me to move. I had been in Washington for about seven years, so in that little weird mid-career area, and I had a research program over there, had to transition it over here. And, you know, when I came to Georgia, I'm going to give a lot of thanks and shout out here to two people in this audience, Dr. Kotke and Dr. Ellis, who were amazing at getting me connected in the area and in the field and to introducing me to all of you guys and being like, hey, let's learn about Georgia. What do you do? What can you offer? And I thank them so much always for that. So when I came to Georgia, I'm a data person. I'm a research person also, so I like my data. They all tease me a little, but I love data. And so we have to use the data, right? Because data feeds what happens. Well, we know this data. We've seen it here before. We know this data. We saw this here. We know this. We've already talked about this. But here's the key. 53% of those are postpartum. So we're back to that same word, postpartum. What is it? Contributors, this came from our MMRC. 42% is obesity, 15% is bias and discrimination, 18% mental health conditions, 13% substance use, all the things we talk about, right, life. And then the majority of deaths, again, intrapartum, peripartum, postpartum. And the contributors we know, the contributors we've talked about. And of course, the majority being cardiac related in terms of maternal deaths. And here is that key, again, table we've seen, or not table, graph we've seen. We know if we added all of those bars up, it's all cardiovascular. That is our driving risk. And then here, I love this one because look at the timing. That's your while pregnant. All of those have one key word, guys, postpartum. That's where it's all happening. Okay. If I haven't made it clear, I really think postpartum is important. What did I say, Kate? It's the golden hour. I think that's what I said. It's the golden hour that we got to catch people. Okay, well then, this doesn't really help us as much either, right? We all know this. There are uh, maternity care deserts in Georgia. There's challenges there. Um, we have nine Georgia counties without a physician, 18 without a family physician, 32 without an internist, 77 without a psychiatrist. So then I wanna take a little bit of a veer here and talk about determinants of health. And here, let's talk about determinants of maternal health. I'm gonna to go to a word, quality, right? We're all here to provide quality. What is quality? Quality is the standard of something as measured against something else of a similar kind. So it's the degree of excellence. And then we talk about equality, right? We want equality. What is equality? Equal treatment for all. But do we want equality or do we want equity? The quality of being fair and impartial. So what do I mean? Let's talk about equality. When you talk about equality, you could argue to some extent in the United States of America, there is some version of equality. We have national evidence-based guidelines, SMFM, ACOG, A1, J I mean, you name them. We all put guidelines out there. We have protocols. Hospitals put out protocols for different things. In theory, could anybody go anywhere? In theory, yes, you have freedom to do so. But this person, when you're talking about equality, could be the person in an urban setting with access to care, adequate insurance coverage, and support systems. This person in this model of equality is that person who's in the underserved setting. No obstetric services, no insurance coverage, and is probably affected by all these other social determinants of health we've talked about. So if we're aiming for that, it's not really gonna help us, especially in this state as we've seen the issues affecting it. So how do we hit equity? Equity is improved insurance access, payer coverage. I mean, I'm glad we have extension and I hope we keep Medicaid extension and I do wanna give a little bit of the difference between extension and expansion. They are two different things. Extension is the concept that we have Medicaid for one year postpartum. Expansion is actually about entering Medicaid and the cutoff you have for getting into Medicaid. So there is a difference there, both being important, but extension is huge because of that one year coverage post. 
Telehealth, we need to push that, right? Like, you may not get specialists in every rural region, but how can I use telehealth to make that better? Support systems, mental health, nutrition, primary care. You can't talk about postpartum without talking about those three issues at all. And I should have put contraception in there. Dr. Kotke, my apologies. And then transportation to higher levels of care when needed in a seamless fashion. That's actually what's gonna lead to equity. And so with Georgia, of course, 70% of the deaths were deemed preventable, and the key contributors came back to chronic health, mental health, and poorly coordinated postpartum care. The word came back, postpartum. And then among the key solutions, they said improve postpartum care. Same word, people. It came back. Let's improve postpartum care. And then especially if you have chronic mental health conditions and cardiometabolic conditions. And so if you think about it, Essentially what we're saying is we were struggling a little bit with the quality because we, don't, we may have equality but we don't have equity and we're struggling a little bit with the equity here. And so that's kind of what led me to this next step. And for this, when I had moved here, and again, remember, you move to a new place, you're getting to know all the new peoples, and you're like, what do I do? And I was talking to Dr. Kotke one day and I said, you know, I really think it'd be cool to have like a postpartum clinic. You know, a place where anybody with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, whatever, they could come and maybe, you know, I could try to do this. We just started. And this was 2021 August that the idea came through. And I moved here in 2020. And she was like, well, why not? Why don't you do it? Because, you know, that's what she says. I'm like, well, I don't know. Can I? Is this doable? Whatever. So then we start. You know, you go through the process. You do all the things. And ultimately, we were able to set up this clinic. So let me tell you what we do, how we set it up, and what happened. So in terms of equity, because that's where I wanted to think a little, how do we improve that piece of equity? I thought, OK, well, let's do a clinic. Let's do telehealth and in-person options, right? Because I mean, again, we've all had that baby. It ain't easy to pack the baby up, get over. So I said, let's do telehealth, let's do in-person, let's see what we can do. Anybody with any cardiometabolic issue in pregnancy, anything. It could even be class three BMI, where they're trying to figure things out. I am open to anybody, anything, whoever wants to come. And I wanted to focus on multidisciplinary care. Mental health, nutrition, primary care, endo. How can we build that collaboration? And my goal with this and this is my ask of all of us here, is to really paradigm shift postpartum care. Again, if you leave this room and you go back and think, what is postpartum care, that's my goal. Because I'm still thinking, what is postpartum care? And I don't know what the answer is, but I know that what we're doing right now isn't working, and we need to do something different. So again, anybody with any of these issues, diabetes, hypertension, really any cardiometabolic issue, the only thing we didn't take was adult congenital heart, but often that's not in the same vein, that's kind of its own separate issue, but really anything else can come. Um, patients can be referred during or after pregnancy. Originally, it actually started with only referrals through Emory, but now we are open to anybody, anyone, anywhere to refer to us. And again, I can do telehealth. Um, this does not replace that standard postpartum visit because there is something about that six-week visit, right? Like when somebody has a C-section, you should look at their incision at six weeks. If somebody comes to you, they should be looking at overall health in six weeks. It is an overall check. It's just not fair to make that 20-minute visit where the person also now, the provider has to talk about arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease 20 years from now and why this woman should care. So this doesn't replace that visit. This is in addition to that visit. And again, like I said, I do in-person and telehealth visits. The clinic started in September of 2022 and it does take Medicaid. So I can, as a provider, take Medicaid. So I do take that and I've had many patients with that. It is still currently at one half session per week. We actually just got funding to hopefully push it more and there have been strategic planning talks to try to push this more, but right now it's a one half session per week. I see six patients per session. Um, they are 30 minute slots, but usually they extend. So I'm just gonna be honest, the clinic goes above its time. It needs to, but everybody's willing to wait a little and that's just the scheduling of it. Um, and really again, any patient with any of this history can be referred to me. And then I have worked to try to create a collaboration with others in CARDS, Endo, Primary Care. Um, we created a mental health resource thing, and then we partnered with like Emory Bariatric Center. They have like some non-surgical weight loss options. So it was a lot of reaching out to folks within the community to see what can we do with this. 
And so this was not by any means an island. This has taken a lot of effort. It's taken a lot of, you know, figuring out partnerships. But again, this is small, guys. This is just, I started this now just hitting two years, and it was just in this system, so the goal is to expand this. This is just like the basics of what has happened so far. And I do thank all of these people, because they really are there. I can text them, call them, email them when I need to get people in. So let's talk about the data and what have we found, and I think this is what I'm most excited about, because last year I actually presented this concept here at this meeting and said we're starting it, but now I actually have data. So this data that I'm gonna present is from September of 2022 to September of 2023, so it hasn't updated the next year. So this is one year worth of data that we've got. First, I wanna start with qualitative data, and this one I have not done in an official fashion yet. Dr. Stanhope is sitting here, and she knows I've been bugging her, and we will be getting this going um, to do more like qualitative interviews and get this piece, but I do wanna talk a little bit about, we do have data on what people have said, so I just wanna mention that first. First, patients often don't understand why their delivery occurred, even when they've had preeclampsia with severe features. And no, it's not the care they had. I mean, I'll be honest, sometimes I even go look at their like op report or their delivery report to see who delivered them. There are people I would trust any day of the week, amazing physicians, it has nothing to do with that. They were overwhelmed, they were scared, they were tired, and they think it's their fault they had their baby early. And the number of times I've heard, I'm so thankful for this visit because we were able to debrief and talk about what happened, innumerable. Um, Explanation of health risks at the time of delivery is overwhelming, guys. Even, I will tell you, I am an MFM provider. Um, full disclosure, my daughter was born in a blaze of glory, fetal growth restriction, elevated Dopplers, oligohydramnios. Trust me, I know what's going on. And I remember the sonographer actually goes, so Dr. Suchi, what do you want to do? And I looked at her and said, call my doctor. I said, I don't want to decide for me right now. Like, I'm 34 weeks, I'm gonna have a preterm delay. She goes, yeah, but you have all, I was like, I, I, I don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna hear my SD ratio, I don't care. Like, call my doctor, because when you are the patient, even when you are a patient who knows everything, I don't wanna know, I don't wanna care at that time, I have enough things to worry about, right? So, that's with knowledge. Now, what about the person who's not got all that knowledge? How do you throw all that on them? It's not fair. They appreciate that opportunity to debrief. It is not a time that I sit there, my first question in this clinic to them is, tell me about your delivery and do you understand what happened surrounding your delivery? And the number of times people say yes isn't very high, so I'll say that. And then they're often absolutely not aware of long-term maternal health risks, no chance. Um, and 50% don't have primary care physicians, so. There's that problem, but that being said, how many of us women before childbirth went to the doctor, let's be real, right? And then when you got a doctor, you had your OB, and then you're like, I think I got a primary care. I mean, do, do we all have primary care physicians? I'd like to know in this group, it's probably not hot. So, you know, it's hard, you're busy, you're tired. And then these are some of the things we've actually heard. I wanna do something to get better, I don't know what to do, I didn't feel heard, I told them my blood pressure was elevated at home, the ED told me I was fine, my child's pediatrician told me my blood pressure was high, I need to go in, I mean, again, real things, all heard, all being said. So that's the qualitative data. Now let's look at the quantitative data, which is where I have a lot of fun. So we had 150 referrals, of which 93 folks attended, which is like a 62% attendance rate in the first year. I took that as a win. I was shocked. I thought we were gonna be lower. And so 93 attended the clinic, 57 didn't. So what we did was we did a comparison of people who were referred among those who attended versus those who didn't, right? To kind of see what happened. And this was done with chart review. It's not your ideal comparison group, because ideally you'd be comparing it to all the people who couldn't attend, but that was harder for us to pull through Epic. So we at least did it for the folks we knew we could capture. And ultimately, if you see, this is a demographic data table. You can see that there's not a big difference. So those are p-values of n. We generally say if it's greater than 0.05, it's not significant. And so if you see here, actually, there's not a big difference in the demographic data between the two groups of people who attended versus did not attend this clinic. But what is interesting is when you look at the people who attended versus did not attend, look at visits attended or scheduled within six months postpartum. Among those who attended, 73% had some version of a follow-up, and only 36% of those who didn't attend had a follow-up. 
And then if you look at cardiology specifically, 51% of, almost 52% of those who attended had a follow-up versus 17% of those who didn't attend. And can I tell you the number of times patients are actually given a cardiology referral on discharge? We have amazing GYN, um, OBGYN physicians on L&D who will be like, oh, you had preeclampsia with severe features, you should go see CARDS. And then they often get my clinic before they've seen CARDS. And they'll come to me and I'll be like, oh, it's fabulous, you've already got CARDS scheduled, blah, blah, blah. You go, well, I was gonna cancel that visit, do I need to go to CARDS? And only after they've heard me say, no, actually the reason you were sent to CARDS is because you have all these risks and I would have sent you if you weren't already scheduled, then they keep their visit. So even if they got the visit scheduled, they're more likely to go if they come and they talk and they understand why, because otherwise they're like, I was tired, I was just gonna cancel the visit, I don't get, my heart is fine, why am I going to cardiology? And then if you look at labs available, for people who attended the clinic, we had 29% at least had some version of follow-up versus only 7% who didn't. And then is there an arrow here? Can I point? Is that too much to ask for? This one? Okay, so look at this. This one is my most interesting piece, and it's hard because I don't have a comparator group, right? We actually looked at how many people wanted to look at nutrition, weight loss, or mental health postpartum. And of course, I don't know this group because they didn't attend. But of the people who attended, 62% wanted that in terms of nutrition, and 44% wanted that in terms of mental health. So this is real. These people need this, they want this, and they're open to taking that access when they get it. Um, and you were two times more likely to have follow-up with primary care cards and uh, or have labs drawn if you attended the clinic. So we actually presented this data. We are working on our paper. Um, and this data was presented at the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. Our goal is to hopefully update it with now another year's worth of data in there as well. So in this little drop in the bucket, do we think we improved quality? I think it's worked. I think we've shown some pilot data This this works. I think we were able to get to some equity here. I think we showed that despite your demographics, if you showed up, we were able to help you a little. So that was good. And so the next question is, where are we going? And I do like this. The future isn't a place that we're going to. It's a place that you go to create. Because I don't know where we're exactly going, actually, to be honest. I think we have to figure that out. And that's where a group like this, that's where societies like this are so important, because it's a state level issue. So ideally, I would love to see a multidisciplinary postpartum transition of care clinic. And that probably, wouldn't it be nice if that was in the paradigm of prenatal care and postpartum care? Like, what if that became the norm? What if that became the way we did things? Wouldn't it be great if we could run a couple of days a week and you had dedicated providers to that and you had telehealth and in-person options? I mean, wouldn't that really be a paradigm shift in how we thought about postpartum care? And then my dream, my pipeline dream, is to have like a postpartum center for health and wellness with the idea being that you could deliver anywhere, get a referral, have a center, we could do in-person or telehealth. And then the idea would be to build local community engagement for different things you need. Because no, not everybody can drive everywhere. That's not possible. But can we build a network and say, okay, if you're in this region, this is who we have for your experts and specialists. This is your nutrition, mental health providers. Could, could groups like this, could societies like this help prove that and improve that? I think that's a key. And then really reaching out to stakeholders, maybe performing focus groups. This is a PCORI grant right here. So if anyone wants to do this, let's do it. But this is the future and this is what I really think we need to do. And I think the key here is it's a marriage. It's a marriage between community and care access. It's a marriage between care access and technology. Dr. Bird and I were just talking right now how much we love technology. We can't do this without technology. Um, whether it's remote blood pressure monitoring, whether it's CGM data, whether it's you know being able to communicate with your physician, whatever it is, it is this marriage that has to happen with your co local community, with community health workers, making sure access and care is there and knowledge is there, and then marrying that with technology. Um, I also think speaking up is really important, and we all try. These are a couple of things that we've done. So this actually just came out. Um, I'm on the Health Policy and Advocacy Committee for the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, and we've just published um, as a position statement from SMFM the importance of extending Medicaid coverage for 12 months postpartum. So this is out, this is presented, this went to legislation from SMFM. 
Um, and we have a second statement coming out from SMFM that's gonna talk about the role of actually MFMs in postpartum. And so um, that is coming out as well um, to really focus on that postpartum period. And then this is coming out as well. Um, we have a maternal mortality um, uh, edition coming out through Atlanta Medicine Magazine for, um, for the community. Uh, thanks to Dr. Callens for pushing us to do this. And we have some amazing articles in here, things we've talked about that need to focus on. The fourth trimester and beyond, see, I told you, it's really a phrase. Um, maternity care desert, the mental health piece. So again, it'd be great if people got access to this. Um, our goal was to really try to hit it. It has people from all over the state who contributed, very thankful to them. Um, so I do think the more we keep speaking up, it's necessary to keep educating everyone out there because again, it is. we think it's very known, but it seems like maybe it's not as known of a topic. And then I just love this quote, do the best you can until you know better than when you know better, do better. So I think we knew what we thought we were doing, but now we don't know what we're doing. So maybe now we have an idea what we should be doing. So maybe we should do it. That was a lot. Um, so thank you. Happy to take questions. <laughs> <laughs>